right, another draft science presentation. Comments, and guess what? There aren't any. <laughs> Just one from Stephen Bro. And unfortunately, um, you know, nice guy, blah, 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 this and that about this and that. Uh, but unfortunately, he's been distracted by many things and hasn't really got to the radar jamming tests. And um, he doesn't really see that it's going to happen in the near future. Um, so, I mean, I'll explain the simplest experiment and just suggest if somebody has some kind of equipment. I mean, you don't need much. It doesn't even have to be radar for this one example. Um, so the idea is to just set up a simple experiment where you're just going to test for the existence of the signal. So you just need a piece of steel, an antenna of some kind, and then have two sources that have the same frequency. Um, best if they're being if they're exactly the same that is they're being fed by the same source but technically they don't have to be if they're at least at the same exact frequency so whether it's gigahertz or megahertz you know it doesn't really matter but it'd be best if you could do a radar experiment just to prove the point uh, because the experiment was done with radar um, you know something around the 10 gigahertz range but anyway and just take the two signals and put them a few feet from the antenna and just have them shoot at the antenna and then just move one of them closer and further away and you should get constructive and destructive interference in the sense that you should get on and off you should be able to turn the signal received at the antenna on and off because the signal will get jammed destructively jammed, constructively not jammed. Um, and that's how it's going to work. And that's what the experiment will show, is that you can have something that looks like interference. The pattern will be on, off, on, off, on, off. And it won't be produced by any wave interference. It will be produced by merely jamming the signal. Um, so, you know, not a complex experiment. So anybody has any kind of basic radio equipment um, should be able to do it and I'd appreciate it if somebody would do it um, and I know it's kind of for somebody who's in radio they're going to say well obviously that's going to happen I mean obviously I can't put two signals out of phase that is at different distances and um, expect to be able to tune in something because the antenna doesn't know that it's not a directional antenna getting hit from the left side is going to be the same as getting hit from the right side. It's not going to be able to receive the signal. These the two signals are going to overlap and uh, it won't be able to decipher the original frequency. Um, even better would be able to test it at twice the frequency. So to be able to test and see if you can detect when they're perfectly out of phase, that is exactly 90 degrees out of phase, however you say it, exactly out of phase, okay, where they perfectly overlap, because then you should receive double the frequency. But obviously it will only happen when they're perfectly overlapped. If they're a little imperfectly overlapped, then you're going to get a weird mess and not be able to receive it. Um, so that's the... that just demonstrates that experiment would demonstrate that it's a perfectly viable explanation for the radar experiment, the two-slit radar experiment. <laughs> it explains what the phenomenon, what's really happening, which is the signals are just being jammed. All right, um, so other subjects. Okay, so I did go to a lot of the guy's links. Yeah, maybe we'll go back to his video, actually, um, you know, his channel and take a look at the uh, um, duality video. <laughs> you know, might as well, right? Um, so I did look at uh, some of the links. A lot of them are for the papers that only have the abstract. It's all really, um, you know, some of it's qubit stuff. I mean, what does that have to do with any of this? Um, you know, they weren't really relevant. So this was the one on polarization. So the exact point I've been making about polarization is, is that the third filter interferes in the sense that it proves that the filters are not passively 
filtering the photons. That is, they don't leave them alone. The ones that get through are changed by the process. And it's exactly what the paper he linked to proposes. So I'll just read this sentence. But what if the so-called filters could not only block components of the stream, but also change them? So, and he goes on to argue about how the third filter, all the filters, basically change the light that goes through. The light that goes through is changed by the process of filtering. <laughs> and that's his explanation. There's no paradox, no strangeness, because the filter is changing it. Now, the implication of that is, is that you can't be doing a bunch of entanglement experiments using polarization as a passive means of detection when it's not a passive means of detection. It's an active means, and it's changing the photons, which blows up your control in the experiment. So you can't really depend on your results because your results could be a manifestation of the fact that your filters are changing what's going through the experiment. Their assumption is the filters are passive. What the third filter proves is that assumption is wrong. The filters aren't passive. So, you know, again, you know, he posts me to a link that basically says exactly what I was saying. It's, he gives a different reason. I mean, this reason... So you can, you can have lots of explanations for how it's changing. His explanation of what's getting changed actually has to do with the magnitude of the light, which doesn't really make any sense, right? I mean, uh, magnitude reduced, it says here. I, I mean, as if you can reduce the magnitude of a photon. You can't do that. <laughs> it's not possible. You can... What you can do is break rays of light into shorter photons, that is, shorter rays, but you can't change the frequency and the speed. You're stuck with those. Polarization doesn't change either one of those things, so you really can't change anything called magnitude. You can just change how much of the ray of a photon gets through. You can break the ray, which I suggest is what polarizing filters are doing. <laughs> um, but I also suggest that they're also correcting the width of the polarization, making it, um, yeah, orienting it more straight so it can go through the next filter. It's, that's why if you add 10 filters, you can get even more light. So adding more filters gets you more, you can add, you have two filters opposite each other right and now you can put in one filter and get more light you put in two filters you get even more light put in four filters you get even more light put in ten filters all perfectly aligned just incrementally going from horizontal to vertical you get even more light so more filters more light just sort of proves the case so anyway um yeah, so I just thought I'd point that out. Like I said, I'll go through some more of the links, but it's they just don't seem very relevant. Um, somebody left some comment that I guess they deleted, but I didn't delete it, and it's not in the spam folder. Um, saying again how Fontenier, uh, whatever, <laughs> um, diffraction is the mathematics that uh, accounts for the two patterns in the double slit and all this stuff. I haven't seen that anywhere. So again, that's just talk. The only thing I've seen that accounts for the two patterns is an engineered equation. I mean, as I've pointed out, mathematics doesn't predict what we don't know. It's an expression of what we do know. So we already know that the two-slit pattern has the envelope. And we know that the envelope is only apparent when the slits are very small. And we know that it's proportional. That as you change the slit width or you change the impediment width, you'll change that envelope. And so they could write another formula that is merely an extension to the formula <coughs> that merely describes the fact that we know there's an effect, that the two things are tied to each other. But it isn't something that the physics itself predicted. It's not something the previous formula predicted. The observations are writing the formula. They're writing the formula to suit the observations, just like they created dark matter to fix their understanding of how galaxies, uh, how the mass in galaxies is distributed. 
and that math is kind of idiotic on its face, just because obviously the mass in galaxies is spread. There's a they're nothing like a solar system. Most of the mass in the solar system is in the sun. Most of the mass, a lot of the mass of a galaxy is in all the crap swirling around in the galaxy. Obviously a galaxy has a lot more crap in it than a solar system has. The mass is spread out. And so how could you even have a theory that you're, you could use the same equations or the same assumptions about how mass is located when you're analyzing a solar system where the mass is concentrated in the center and you're analyzing a galaxy where obviously there's a lot more mass you know in the orbits uh, so these are just obvious flaws I mean I'll get back to the primary argument the, the argument that makes it all understandable as nonsense is the fact that they don't have any energy None of their understanding of gravity or magnetism or electricity, none of it has any explanation for where the energy comes from. Where, how does the magnet, even if you believe in an ether, how does the magnet perturbate the ether? Where does the energy come from for the magnet to poke the ether to cause an effect? Where does it have the and where does the where's the energy burned? Where where's the fire? Where's the oil? Where's the gasoline? Where's the hydrogen? Where's the something that gets converted into energy? There's nothing to convert in the magnet. The magnet doesn't have a perpetual energy source. So it has to be coming from the outside. Once you understand that, then it's all it all falls into place. And the same is true for gravity. You know the earth doesn't get smaller. You know the sun it's burning, uh, uh, radi it's radiating light, so it's getting smaller because it's burning and it's radiating real particles, real stuff. But you know, it's not making gravity that way. You know, it's not. There's not. There's no accounting for the gravitational force. There's no accounting for how it's making the Earth move, and there's certainly no accounting for its movement, its procession, its spin, all of that stuff. Where did the energy come from? How did it get so frickin' hot? Where is all the pressure coming from? What's causing all the pressure? I mean, these are obvious questions. How, how, like, you know the Earth, if you go down a few hundred feet, you know the pressure gets substantial. You know the water pressure. You go down a few hundred feet. Incredible water pressure. Where is that coming from? Where is the energy to create that pressure coming from? And that should be the giveaway that this stupid answer of bent geometry is a silly answer. It's not explaining where the energy comes from because it's real energy. And that should give you some reason to just doubt that this is anything like a credible theory. All of their mechanics has no explanation for the source of the energy. It's just so obviously it's a it's a, it's just a glaring omission not to have a source for the energy all right so yeah let's play his uh his stuff uh, zoom 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 uh should still be here yeah it is so we'll do this one wave particle duality Hopefully you'll remember from Quantum Mechanics 1.2 that we just got done looking at Max Planck's solution to the ultraviolet catastrophe. After Max Planck... Yes, no, I didn't bother with that because it was way too uh, eigenstate bullshit math. I could solve the ultraviolet catastrophe. His work on the subject went unspoken about for quite a while. Planck's trick of putting the energy of light into little packets was regarded by himself and most of his colleagues as just that, a trick. But uh, I mean, it's an obvious conclusion to draw so again that's it's to call it a trick is just to say it's, it's kind of nonsensical because we kind of see it all over the universe that things come in clumps to use a Feynman term <laughs> okay I mean it's an observable reality just like Feynman said photons comes in clumps you don't get half a clump half a photon 
As far back as 1887, evidence was being collected for a phenomenon that would take Planck's trick to new heights and lead to the birth of wave particle duality. The photoelectric effect was what sparked Einstein to postulate that Planck's light quanta were physical particles. Physicists at the time were really excited about playing around with electricity and doing all sorts of experiments with it. It turned out that if you had a piece of metal and irradiated it with light, you could measure a current flow from it. Electrons were somehow being ejected from the metal surface when exposed. Now, let's understand that ejecting electrons and creating electricity are two different things. Um, they really are. Um, current uh, in a wire isn't, doesn't necessitate electrons actually going somewhere just necessitates electrons moving. That's why alternating current works so well, is because the electrons just stay where they are and they just vibrate back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But even in a DC current, the migration of the electrons is pathetically slow compared to what you would argue to be the uh, amount of energy passing through the wire. So the real thing that's moving is the little bits that are compressing or expanding the electrons. So all the electrons really do is move apart. The atoms move away from each other and the atoms move closer together. The electrons get more compressed or the electrons are further apart. But that's all that really happens. Electrons don't actually go anywhere. To light. We now call these photoelectrons. Now, this effect wasn't impossible at all with the current understanding of both electromagnetic theory and the structure of metals. Physicists at the time had a half decent model for metallic structure called the Drude model. This was heavily inspired by the statistical mechanics being done. So, but again, this is an idea where it goes with their theory, okay? <laughs> uh, they can say it, but they really haven't proven that this is why metals conduct electricity. It just really has to do with the fact that their electrons are in shells that are easily compressed and expanded. That the distances between them are easily controlled. And that each atom feels the pressure of the other atom. So they're basically sharing electrons, which is much more important than free electrons. More important than having free electrons is having electrons the atoms are actually sharing, which means that they are pressurizing both atoms at the same time. So it's like understanding something as a rubber band tied to nodes. And if you consider, you know, one node to be a shared node, and this is one atom and this is the other atom, anything I do to atom number one, atom number two is going to feel. time. So whilst it was possible under the current theory that electrons could be emitted, many of the observations that followed were simply not possible under the Maxwellian theory of light. The physicists investigating this phenomenon found that firstly, emission of electrons only occurred when the frequency of the incident light was... So, and again, the emission doesn't mean that they're um, released and freed. It just means they leave and they go back, <laughs> usually. Um, uh, because if they leave in any kind of permanent way, then the material just oxidizes or obviously corrodes um, as you um, steal its electrons. The puff a certain threshold frequency that depended on the material. For most metals, it's usually somewhere in the ultraviolet region or above. Secondly, the maximum kinetic energy of the emitted electrons wasn't affected by the intensity of the incident light. And intensity, they just mean the amount of the light. So again, the, the, you know, they're using words that aren't very good because this is really just about how much energy and how much period of time you're imposing on something. And just like a, I've sort of given the example of trampolines or something else, right? I mean, if I throw something at a trampoline and it only pushes in a certain amount, you know, a little bit, then there's only a little bit of energy. But if I throw things quickly enough, you can get the idea that it pushes one thing in before the trampoline has time to push it back out, you hit it again. And then before it has time to push back out, you hit it again. Well, then you know you're going to be setting up a much a more substantial amount of energy shooting out. You're loading the system with energy. And that's what really the photoelectric effect represents, is that ultraviolet light comes quickly enough that the electrons can't rebound, so you're pushing them back further, causing more pressure. 
then they shoot back when they they're finally allowed to shoot back they shoot back and release the electron at a higher velocity <laughs> because of the fact that you hit them deeper into the pressure you depress the trampoline far enough to shoot the electron out the current amplitude would increase, but the maximum kinetic energy of the electrons remain constant for a given frequency. And lastly, the time between light being exposed to the surface and the emission of electrons was practically instantaneous. So this is more nonsense. It's either practically instantaneous. What does that mean? The speed of light is, from our perspective, almost practically instantaneously. I mean, I turn a light on, it's, oh, the light gets to be practically instantaneously. So that's just a that that's just such bad language for a physicist to use. I mean, it's terrible. It's just awful. We know that even if there was a fifty percent reduction in the length of time it took the event, just like light passing through a glass lens or something, we don't notice. Oh, it went forty percent slower. We don't notice that. Yeah, it's, so it's just kind of silly. It is, of course, finite, somewhere around 10 to the minus 16, which is incredibly small. None of these... Yes, yes, and light is incredibly fast. Experimental observations were accounted for by the classical Maxwellian theory of light. So, so again, more calling Maxwell classical, which is hilarious. <laughs> you know, so this word is just used to describe every other theory in the universe except ours. It's called something called classical, and we're going to just insult it. Um, even though they haven't accounted for all those theories or all those explanations. So they're just generically saying somehow we know we've heard all of your stories before and they're all wrong. <laughs> you know, wrong. It's just pathetically arrogant. Right. Einstein, however, was able to account for these observations. He postulated that Planck's light quanta were physical particles. Instead of thinking of light as a wave, it could be considered something akin to an electron or a proton. Yeah, uh, but you have to understand that a photon wouldn't be akin to an electron or a proton because the word photon is really describing at least two entities. The frequency would be the distance between the quanta. That would be accounting for the frequency, unless you think the quanta could be 10 miles long in a radio wave. You know, that the quanta itself is 10 miles long. No, what's 10 miles is the distance between one quanta and another quanta at the speed of light. There's 10 miles of distance between them. <laughs> you know, but the, the quanta aren't 10 miles long. See, so these are just, you know, there's so many details here that they just you know they fluff over them they just say we're going to consider all theories are Joe's theory and anyone who disagrees with us believes what Joe believes and they'll just argue Joe's theory they they'll just say there are no other explanations they'll just pigeonhole everybody who disagrees with them as some Neanderthal and they it's, it's like they're not allowed to be um, you know, humanus smartius. But most importantly, for a given frequency nu, a photon would have a well-defined energy h nu. Einstein. Yeah, yeah. So again, it's just you know, sort of obvious that the whole way the photon derives whatever it has as momentum and energy is going to be derived based on we know the speed is constant. So all there is is the frequency. And so they're just replacing frequency with H now. Pose the mechanism by which photoelectric emission could occur. When a photon is incident on a metal, it can penetrate into the surface where it has a probability of being absorbed by an electron in the delocalized C. The electron will gain an energy equal to H nu and then undergo transport out of the metal lattice to cause photoelectric emission. The electron, however... <clears throat> right, but that wouldn't explain why a electron couldn't be hit by um, numerous infrared photons that happen to be pushing it in the same direction. You know, that is, once it gets hit by the first one, it gets hit by a second one, doubles its momentum, and it gets hit by a third one, triples its momentum, and then it reflects. That would also be a way of, a, of an electron escaping by your theory. So in a sense, it really doesn't explain 
the photoelectric effect at all, because it doesn't account for the fact that there's something substantially different about the higher frequency. It, it means something, and it means something like tipping point. It means something in the sense that you have to hit it. The electron has vulnerable frequencies. Frequencies when you're high enough, you're going to hit it before it can rebound. So it's a frequency higher than the rebound frequency of the atoms and their pressure. So the pressure of the metal atoms has to be higher, um, one would think, and that's why it requires this higher frequency to eject the uh, electron. What we'll have to do some work to overcome the attraction to the positive ions that keep it bound in the overall structure. So the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectrons will be the energy imparted on so it. So again, this photoelectrons, well, it's just a nonsense term, isn't it? Isn't this just a nonsense term? There's electrons and there's photons. There's no photon, the photoelectrons. That's just nonsense gibberish. I mean, they can't, you know, they just make up crap all the time. A photoelectron? What the hell are you talking about? By the photon, H nu, minus the energy required to leave the metal, something we call the work function phi. The electrons therefore won't be able to leave the metal unless they have enough energy to overcome the work function. The minimum frequency, nu naught, required for the electrons to overcome the work function will be when their maximum kinetic energy is zero. So this frequency, nu naught, is given by phi over Planck's constant. So we see Einstein's model predicts the existence of a threshold frequency. Right, but the, the threshold for frequency really just has to do with, again, the argument is like a tipping point argument. You have to hit, the, if you want to knock something over with energy that's too weak to do it as just a single baseball, then you know you have to keep hitting it and creating constructive, you have to hit it constructively so that the energy is increasing and being stored in the object. So the whole idea is you hit it, you let it rock back and forth, and you hit it again. You let it rock back and forth, and then you hit it again. And you're adding energy to the system. So higher frequencies can add energy to the system. Low frequencies don't add any energy because the likelihood is, is that you hit it the first time, it wobbles, and it's coming back, and you're hitting it when it's going the wrong way. <laughs> it's totally destructive. So you're not going to get more motion out of the electron. You're going to get less motion. I mean, you know, I'm not saying you have to accept that my theory is correct. The point of me pointing out this illustration is, is there's lots of possible, perhaps lots, of possible explanations, mechanical explanations for the consequence. They've accepted one, Einstein suggests one, and then they all say, yes, I vote for it. And they never even heard the other suggestions. They never even heard the other mechanisms. Just like with polarization, there's lots of ways to explain what polarization is. Yet they've closed their minds, put their blinders on, they see it only one way, they will only discuss it in one terms, because they've closed the door uh, based on very little evidence, just because they want a conclusion. They want something to be a fact now, and they really don't want to do the work to figure out if that fact is correct. frequency required to observe photoelectric emission that depends on the material being used, as phi is a property of the metal. Under this mechanism of photoelectric emission, the intensity of the incident radiation wouldn't have any effect on the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectrons, but it would increase the amplitude of the current, since there will be more photons to be absorbed by electrons in the metal. Now, so again, the difference between converting it into electrical current, which is just the pressure communicated between atoms, is very different than actually ejecting an electron. The two things are not the same thing, but they're certainly related. Any good theory should produce a plethora of experimentally verifiable results, even if the theory turns out to be wrong. If it produces well-defined predictions that can be tested... So again, more of this well-defined predictions. Again, these formulas were not created before you saw the effects. They're created after you saw the effects. You're creating something to, to mimic the effects. You're, you're just trying to mimic it, to model it. And there's a big difference between mimicking and, and accurately identifying and modeling. So your model can mimic but not be right. And you're done accounting for that. You're saying somehow the model is right if it is consistent with the outcome that you already know. 
that you already used to draw up your model. Your model's already a manifestation of the outcome. It was completely written by the outcome. How can you sit there and say, I'm going to test it by seeing if it matches the outcome? Well, of course it's going to match the outcome because you wrote it to match the outcome. I mean, how can you call that a prediction? It's just ludicrous. By scientific standards, it's a good theory. For a textbook example of a theory that's good... It's a circular reasoning. I mean, it should be the, defi the dictionary definition of circular reasoning should be this mathematical lie that your math predicts. When, no, your math was written by you knowing. But not correct. See the steady state theory in cosmology. To test Einstein's theory, we could imagine having a glass vacuum chamber with a metal cathode at one end and an anode at the other end, connected to an amy. So, so do silly thought experiments rather than doing real experiments. Is that what we're doing? We're going to imagine something, <laughs> you know? And again, it doesn't prove uh, Einstein's theory correct because it's not a narrow enough experiment to do that. Again, there can be lots of explanations for possible causes for the outcome. And you're just so insanely arrogant to think you've accounted for them all. That somehow you debunked all the other possibilities. No, you didn't. And if you had, I mean, extremely precise evidence showing yours can be the only theory possible, then you might have some reason to be this arrogant. But you don't. What you have are thought experiments. You have words like virtual photon. You don't have anything like hard evidence. Dirt in a variable voltage source. If we don't apply any potential difference across the electrodes and then irradiate the cathode with some electromagnetic radiation, we can expect to see a current when the frequency of the radiation is above the threshold frequency. Once photoelectric current is flowing, we could increase the potential across the electrodes in a negative polarity so the electrons have to do work to overcome the potential. Since the potential difference is the work done per unit charge, the work done by the electrons would be E times the potential difference. We could then keep increasing the voltage in the negative sense until no current is observed at some negative potential V0. At this point, the electrons have expended all of their kinetic energy in doing work against the potential. This is what's called a stopping potential. Since at this point, the maximum kinetic energy uh, I mean, this is like you could make a metaphor to bullets or something, right? If you could uh, create a, a frictionless environment or something, some perfect ricochets. Um, let's see, how else could you metaphor this? But, I mean, it's just kind of obvious. You're just sitting there saying, well, I have a motorboat, and I'm going to put it in a stream, and I'm going to say, is my motorboat got enough energy to get upstream? I mean, you know, you know. Energy is equal to EV naught. We can relate the stopping potential to the frequency of the incident radiation and the work function. Since E, H, and phi are constant, we have a linear relationship between V naught and nu. So if we then change the frequency a bit and readjust the voltage to obtain a new stopping potential, we can gain a series of measurements of V naught and nu. If the theory's predictions are correct, plotting these on a graph should give a linear relationship. For yeah, but I, again, the, the fact that there would be a linear relationship was no surprise. So again, you haven't excluded a ton of other explanations that would also argue that of course there's going to be a linear relationship a proportional relationship well, if you do this experiment you'll find exactly that the theory makes such precise predictions okay so again it's such a precise prediction we already knew what the outcome was we already knew what we're looking to make the the formula produce and then he says well look we made a formula that produces it gee <laughs> i mean that's just it's so, that's such a cheat. To which are experimentally verified, it's hard not to be convinced that light has at least some kind of particle like nature. The kind of behavior. Well, again, I don't think it's a very convincing argument for particle nature. I think it is a convincing argument for quanta. In which light is considered both a wave and a particle is what's called wave particle duality, unsurprisingly. Right, so now you're going to finally get to that subject. Oh, okay. So I guess his, his point was he would show the evidence for particle and now he's going to show the evidence for wave and then say uh, this is an acceptable compromise when there's no reason to compromise. Compromise isn't what physicists should be doing. People looking for facts <laughs> shouldn't be compromising because that doesn't, that's not how you get to the truth. The truth isn't left-right. The truth is left or right.
The evidence for wave particle duality doesn't stop at the photoelectric effect. Another significant phenomenon is Compton scattering, named after Arthur Compton. If light really does behave like a particle, then surely it should engage in some other particle-like phenomena. One of the simplest ways two particles... So again, this article, this, this idea that they all particles would act the same. I mean, obviously, charged particles are going to be very different than uncharged particles. Dipoles will be very different than monopoles. So this whole idea that all particles can be put into some category, and we can say they all have the same properties, and then we can have certain expectations for how they function. I think that's just fucking retarded. <laughs> you know, no way can you think that way. The particles are quite different. An electron is substantially different than a proton, quite obviously. Exactly the opposite charge. It will not behave the same way as an electron. It's going to interact with each other is by colliding and bouncing off of each other. The process physicists... Right, and we have no evidence that they actually do that, I would argue. There's no evidence that an electron ever bounces off of another electron it always ends up bouncing off the field produced by the other electron. So this electron bounces off the field produced by this electron, and this electron bounces off the field produced by this electron, in the sense of the ping-pong ball pressure. The pressure increases, the little ping-pong balls go back and forth, create more and more pressure. The little ping-pong balls, the force, uh, is what they bounce off of. They don't bounce off each other, they bounce off a force the very force that creates electricity and magnetism. Oh, scattering. Compton scattering is one such process. It needs both wave particle duality and special relativity to explain it. We could consider a photon with some energy h nu colliding with stationary electron. <laughs> so, so we're talking about frequency times velocity. Well, I mean, I don't know what they're using v for here. Um, but obviously we know that velocity is a constant, so, you know, why change the equation? In a special relativistic context, the total energy squared of a body of mass m and momentum p is given by the equation e squared equals p squared c squared plus m squared c to the fourth. The incoming photon is massless, so it has energy e equal... So this is more nonsense, right? Because obviously if it's bent by gravity, it can't be massless. So that's another contradiction in their physics that makes absolutely no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> Equals PC equals H nu. I mean, it can't have it can't it can't have momentum if it's massless. It, it's just not possible. There's the zero in the equation. There's no no momentum. It doesn't matter what its velocity is. Velocity times zero is zero. The electron, on the other hand, is at rest and has no momentum, so it has energy equal to its mass times c squared. So more nonsense. The electron obviously does have. Uh, momentum and mass. So I don't even know what that statement was. Should we play that again? I mean, electrons have. Didn't he just say that? Uh oh. <laughs> Mouse go. What is failing here? Let's see if it still plays. If the yeah. photon acts like a particle, then it should scatter off the electron, imparting some momentum on it and recoiling at some angle theta. The photon has now lost energy to the electron. So in order to conserve energy. Theta, theta. Um, <laughs> yeah, so again, it's this idea that photons can lose energy is retarded. Um, all you can do is convert. You can consume some portion of the quanta, like if you consume ultraviolet light where 10 things go in a in one second. And then you can have, have infrared radiation leave where 10 things go out in a half second. Uh, I mean the other way around. So it's a half second for the ultraviolet light and it's a full second for the same 10 to leave as infrared light. Now, the same amount of energy leaves, but it's over a longer period of time. And that conversion means that for the period of time that is the conversion, the electron possessed the momentum and was moving. So any conversion requires the electron to absorb the amount of energy that's being consumed by that amount of time. Well, that's probably too complex for you its frequency must change to some new frequency, new prime. If we apply conservation of momentum and energy, we can show that the change in wavelength is h over mec squared times 1 minus cos theta. I'll leave the working out of this to a special relativity series, but it's not too hard to show. This change in wave... Yes, you don't need any special relativity to understand 
okay, that time is the critical factor in all of this stuff. The stuff is moving the speed of light. If an event, okay, passing straight through would mean, you know, a certain amount of energy leaves at a certain amount of time. It covers a certain amount of distance. Now, if you slow it down, like most, like, like what happens in glass, that slowing it down has to be accounted for because that's essentially an absorption of energy. Okay, you've taken momentum that was go happening, and now the momentum has been delayed. And by delaying the momentum, that is stopping the light from getting where it was going, you have to account for the, all that movement. So that movement has to be translated somehow, and it has to be translated into some form of energy. Yeah, my mouse and batteries are dead. <laughs> yeah, what do I do? I don't have extra batteries here at the moment, so I guess I'm stuck with the keyboard. Length is going to be of the order 10 to the minus 12 meters. In order for this to be comparable to the initial wavelength, Compton scattering is best done with X-rays or gamma rays, which have similar or smaller wavelengths. Compton scattering is an effect that's always of consideration when light interacts with matter. And you may be thinking, how can light both scatter off electrons in Compton scattering and be absorbed by them in the photoelectric effect? Well, this is all down to the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. There are lots of different ways in which a photon can interact with an electron. Some are just far more likely than others under certain conditions. But in principle, a number of different interactions. Yeah, so that's just gibberish. Again, you didn't really account for the point being made. Uh, but clearly, the, the, the simple part of that argument is lots of things are happening inside of atoms, and it depends on the condition they're in. So obviously, scattering is happening to individual atoms where the photoelectric effect is not happening to individual atoms, it's how, happening to steel, it's happening to a conductor, a bunch of atoms connected to each other. Um, a lot of conductors, when you turn them into a gas, aren't so conductive <laughs> anymore. So clearly part of being a conductor is actually having the, um, being the right kind of crystal, being in a crystal form a solid form. It's not a conductor when it's not solid. Not as good a conductor. Actions will occur when, say, x-rays are fired at a metal surface. In fact, Compton scattering will occur if you do a photoelectric experiment, but it's usually of secondary, if any, importance and won't add too much error to your experiment. But it is happening. Clearly there's a lot of evidence for light acting as a particle, so we'd be justified in asking, is the converse true? Are there particles that act like waves? Yes. All of them, but like almost all no. So again, all of them. That's just silly bullshit. Okay, bowling balls don't act like waves. Lots of things that don't act like waves that you could say are particles. The Earth doesn't act like a wave. The Sun isn't acting like a wave. It's just crap. You know. Again, this word particle is just totally useless when they're going to use it this way to say all things that are identified as a thing, an individual thing. We're going to call it a particle. I mean, it just ruins the word particle. Always, we really only care about electrons. If there were one phenomena we had to pick to test if particles could act like waves, it would surely be diffraction, which makes sense as diffraction is only caused by waves. Diffraction is when a wave... So, so an amazing statement, right? I mean, to take a word where diffraction, like refraction or reflection, it's one of those kind of words. It's just another kind of reflection. It's another kind of deviation in something's path. And for him to say that diffraction only happens in wave phenomenon is just to deny the fact that you can have things called reflections, okay, <laughs> and you can have things that are called diffractions in the sense that, yes, it didn't reflect off a surface, it, it was absorbed by an electron and readmitted in a new momentum, a new, a new um, vector. And that is not anything, I mean, that's a Feynman diagram. I mean, Feynman diagrams aren't really showing you anything called wave, okay, diffraction. They're just showing you diffraction. They, like light, passes through a slit or around an object, causing it to bend. The most important case is really when light passes through a slit. If we send a beam of light through a very narrow slit and then observe it some... So let's just say that, again, this is just kind of a, a dangerous thing to start saying is, is this bending word, right? Because it's not really being honest to call it bending when 
it's clearly just an angle change. So it's a reflection. I mean, we don't call a reflection bending light. You could have things that multiply reflect something. We don't call it a bend. You know, if I create an angle and it reflects here and it reflects here and it comes back going this way, people don't say it bent the light. They clearly say it reflected or deflect deflected the light. So I, this is just a, you know, this is the mushy part where, you know, words don't really mean anything. Wave isn't really waves because they don't spread, they don't do this, they don't do that. So, you know, it's just such a breaking of a concept. We know the individual photons are not doing this stuff. They're moving in straight lines between point A and point B. And the key thing that's happening is the photon is being deflected. That's what's happening. And it's a fair word to use to call it diffraction. This is being deflected by the electrons. Distance away on the screen, we see fringes of light and dark. When the light passes through the slit, it bends and spreads out. The smaller the slit, the more dramatic the bending. When so again, I could say the more dramatic the deflecting. And we know that the bending is very precise in these angles, right? 3 degrees, 6 degrees, 12 degrees, 15 degrees. It, you know, it's not bending it to those precise angles. It's deflecting it to those precise angles. When the light reaches the screen, it interferes with itself either constructively or destructively. We won't go into too much detail here, but constructive interference causes the wave amplitude to increase, giving right... <clears throat> Which is also nonsense, right? I mean, this is just the photon plus photon equals two photons. Photon plus photon equals no photon. That's not a, 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 a suitable energy equation. So clearly where there's destructive interference, the photon's still going somewhere. The photon isn't destroyed. It goes to where the constructive interference is. So again, this is just such a, <laughs> you know, these words are totally destructive to accurate understanding. Clearly, there's nothing destructive about the event. The event doesn't destroy energy. The event doesn't destroy the photon. What the, what the event does is move the photon to a different location. That's very different than destroying. So again, this word destructive is just destructive. To bright fringes. And destructive interference does quite the opposite, suppressing the wave amplitude and giving rise to dark fringes. These light and dark... Uh, the, this, this, again, this wave amplitude. There's, you haven't proven there's a wave. You certainly haven't proven the wave has anything called amplitude. There's either photon or no photon. There's not amplitude. <laughs> okay? There's either a clump or no clump, as Feynman would say. So again, this isn't consistent with anything. These aren't consistent with words Feynman would use. The f you know, one of the fathers of quantum mechanics. Fringes are irregularly spaced in well-defined intervals. We call such a pattern an interference pattern. The study of such things is unsurprisingly called interferometry. It's the exact... Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's surprising that the, you're, you're, the fact is that you'll consider something that has no lenses... <laughs> the same as something that has lenses, you call that the same science. Um, yeah, you know these are these are very different mechanisms, and here you are pretending it's all the same thing when it's not really all the same thing. And again, you're saying that any on-off pattern we're going to declare that wave interference when no, it's the simplest pattern you can create in the universe on off on off. The, there's the simplest definition of pattern is on off on off. <laughs> effect is behind the science of gravitational wave detection. Oh, I mean, more nonsense. What, what, what you know, the science behind, you know, the, the, the science behind gravitational wave detection is first they had to contrive ludicrous mathematics that allowed them to make the signal that, that we could actually receive it. And the only way they could make it receive it was they had to turn it into some kind of super energy that wasn't a real particle. Because if they made it out of real particles, it doesn't have enough energy to get here. So they had to make it out of bent space. And how do they make bent space? Well, they decided that we're going to turn solar masses into bent space. We're going to convert matter into bent space. No evidence that that can be done. No evidence that that happens in the universe. I mean, the whole thing is mush. Ah, still no function here. Come on. Oh, now the mouse isn't working. 
We're able to see it's working, below, but not it's clicking. Working. Stenography. Anyway, the point is that these interference patterns are the result of waves diffracting. But experiments again, can be done to show that you. electrons do the exact same thing. It says you. So again, just more nonsense. And there's no evidence that electrons do anything that's the same. Because clearly electrons are bouncing off of electrons. So clearly the, the electron experiment can be explained. And, and, and it's, the explanation is more proof that you're wrong. Because the difference between the two patterns, when viewed, is the electron pattern is much smoother, much more, much more gradual from light to dark to light to dark, much more sinusoidal in the pattern. And why is that so? Well, that's because electrons do have fields, uh, and they're repelling each other. They have ping pong ball bouncing between them, and they, they push off of each other. So they deflect at imprecise, less precise angles um, because of that because they're bouncing off a field that's much bigger than the electron itself. So they behave as if they were much larger objects than they actually are. We can do an experiment a bit like the photoelectric effect, where we have a cathode and an anode inside a vacuum chamber. If we apply a high enough voltage across the electrodes, electrons can be torn from the cathode and accelerated towards the anode. But if the anode is made out of a mesh rather than a solid sheet of material, most of the electrons will pass straight through, effectively I don't know about most, <laughs> so but anyway, uh, some percentage will pass through. That's right, um, and they will be as you've just drawn them diverging, and they will also be losing momentum. So once they pass through, they're going to be losing momentum, creating an electron gun. This itself has a bunch of applications, but if we fire the electrons at a thin sheet of metal with a photodetector on the other side. We actually observe circular diffraction patterns as the electrons diffract through the metal in a wave-like nature. So electrons. So so again, this isn't the you know the typical two-slit pattern shown in electrons as a bar pattern. So again, this is a different variation on the same theme. But again, I would argue that Newton's rings and the the slit experiments are really the same thing. You're just taking a a, a segment and showing the segment rather than the circle. So if you made round apertures you'd end up with a ring-like pattern instead of rectangular apertures. I also have some kind of wave-like nature as well. The wave particle duality... So again, no, no wave-like nature really necessary for an explanation. They never tried other explanations. They want it to be waves. They're making it into waves. Not because the evidence indicates it's waves, just because they like it. Matter is what led Louis de Broglie, de Broglie, de Broglie, de, de Broglie, to postulate that matter particles had some wavelength lambda inversely proportional to their momentum by Planck's constant. Right now, this is just more made-up nonsense. We already know that they don't have any frequency. The electrons don't have a frequency. It's silly to give them one artificially. Volkswagens driving down the road at 40 miles an hour don't have a frequency but they've decided to associate frequency with momentum because it's true with electro with photons that the frequency means more cannonballs per a period of time which means more momentum obviously if i shoot all the bullets at once okay the, there's more momentum in that packet of energy uh, and if i spread it up over a bigger period of time well then the, yeah the packet of energy has just as much momentum but it's now spread over a much larger period of time. So time is everything in these equations. And so this is just, this is just a fraud. There's no such thing as an electron frequency. We can shoot electrons at a frequency, but they don't innately have any frequency. It's just a lie. All they have is a speed and a mass. I mean, it's just such a, it's such a fraud. Oh. Now it was H bar K. So with the wave particle duality of all things firmly in place, physicists were able to answer a really important question. Why haven't all of the atoms exploded? I guess that was some sort of joke. Oh, yeah, that was great science. Why haven't all the atoms exploded and the volume gets silly loud and it just plays for another 30 seconds? What the fuck was the point of that? Yeah, 
just loud and obnoxious for no good reason. Super. Uh, anyway, uh, maybe my mouse made it louder, I don't know, but whatever that was. So, just cliche crap. Defending a stupid compromise that can't really... I mean, if you're a reasonable person, you've got to have a, a bias for one or the other. You can't be just sitting there saying, yeah, it's... Uh, you know, I can't, you know, you have to give it some sort of reality. And it either is a perturbation in an ether or it's a particle. So you're either an etherist or you're a particleist. And they want to play both, they want to be both genders. And it's just bullshit. It's, it's just queer physics. It's not good science, that's the point. I, I don't mean anything against... Queer is just a fun word, so sorry. No offense, man. Um, <laughs> but it, it's just wrong to think you can have it both ways. Because you really can't. It's not good science. Alright, so that's enough of a video. Um, and such. So, till the next time. Yeah. I think I've done enough here. <laughs> it's about the energy, stupid. <laughs> Yeah, the energy for gravity, the energy to make planets move, the energy in quantum mechanics that allow magnets to move towards each other or magnets to move away from each other. Where's the energy come from? Big important question. And if you don't have an answer, you've got bad physics. And such. Ah, control G, wrong one. <laughs> yeah, I have to try another button. <laughs>